something you'll take away today. Again, thank you for your attendance. We absolutely appreciate everybody being here. We have uh, staff around. If there's anything we can do to help or assist you in any way, certainly let us know. I want to again thank our, our sponsors. This is not possible without the sponsors who helped put it together. Uh, so again, thank you to Istonish, Tempest Nova, Granicus, Ruben Brown, Revision, AO Docs, DocuSign, and Google. We certainly appreciate all of our sponsors who make this possible. Uh, speaking of sponsors who make this possible, uh, our platinum sponsor for today is Colorado Interactive. We should all give them a special round of thanks because this evening at the reception, they are supplying the adult beverages, so thank you, CI, for that. <laughs> so it's this, at this time that it's my pleasure to introduce um, Marty Hartley. Uh, Marty is uh, a great asset to Colorado Interactive, uh, in fact, we talked to the other group. Marty has his background in local government. He worked about 20 years at Jefferson County before going to uh, Colorado Interactive. So please welcome our platinum sponsor, Colorado Interactive and Marty Hartley. Thank you, Jack. Um, I'll be brief with our, an overview of CI. Uh, I think maybe some of you came to our presentation earlier. Uh, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of NIC. NIC was founded in Kansas about 26 years ago, and they created the self-funded model that we use here in Colorado. We have um, business units in 28 states, similar to Colorado Interactive. Um, and also in the federal space. So we're the folks that bring you the payment processing, the Drupal content management system, uh, a couple of mobile apps, um, and uh, all, the, all the beverages this afternoon. So, so don't forget that. If you haven't learned anything else today, at least get a drink and, and relax this afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce, introduce you to Sylvain Monsat. Sylvain is the co-founder and CEO of Wispley. In his role, he leads the company's strategic vision as well as being an internationally known expert and speaker on whistleblowing. Sylvain started Wispley after uncovering one of the largest cases of corporate fraud in Australia. From his experience as a whistleblower, he realized employees needed a better way to report fraud and misconduct. He created Wispley to help make whistleblowing safe and easy for employees, as well as providing a platform for organizations to better identify and address risk. Sylvain has over 20 years of experience in governance, risk, and compliance, with a focus on procurement and supply chain. He's also worked across various industries, including banking, construction, mining, oil and gas, and automotive. Having lived and worked in Europe, Asia Pacific, and North America, Sylvain and his family now make their home in Boston, Massachusetts. Please welcome Sylvain. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Thank you for uh, having me, um, Jack, Catherine, and the broader team at, uh, at SIPA. Um, it's always a, a delight to come to Colorado. I think you live in a very special place. So glad I'm here today and, and glad that was an opportunity to, uh, to speak to you all. Um, if power goes off on my laptop, no problem. That's the only slide I've got for the whole presentation. So don't worry too much about it, uh, but we should be okay. Um, the reason why I don't have more slides is because my job is to actually travel the world and tell my story um, and, um, and sometimes share stories of um, other people's, whether um, whistleblowers or, um, you know, former felons or criminals. And, um, and today's story is going to start up to, you know, um, to your specific um, industry, which, you know, government um, agencies and, and, and what happens in those agencies on a daily basis that you're not, you may, you're may, maybe not aware of. Um, just to set some context, uh, Marty did say that I was, um, you know, uncovered a, a large fraud in Australia. 
you may have picked up a, an interesting accent in my voice. I'm definitely not from South Africa, in case you were wondering that. Uh, I'm origi originally from France, where um, I grew up and lived for the first um, 26 odd years of my life, and then decided to um, learn a bit of English and, uh, and went to a, uh, a remote place called Australia, where I spent actually um, 13 years. Um, and I now have uh, three kids, all born in, uh, in Sydney, uh, and my wife and three kids now live in Boston, Massachusetts. So we little frozies, as we like to call us, French Australians. Uh, we love being in the, in the US for the last 10 months. Um, I think it's a, it's a great place to work, a great place to live, uh, and for me it's a great place to actually connect with the rest of the world being on the East Coast. Um, so I'll take you back to you know, what happened to myself back in 2012 when I was in Australia, um, two months into a new job in a large corporate. And, um, and I'll take you through the journey of, uh, of being a whistleblower and then what happened next and what led me to actually create um, a company out of my learnings and, and the different people that I've met along the way. Um, so my background is procurement and supply chain. I did work um, at uh, uh, management level in a very large Fortune 500 called Schneider Electric back in, uh, uh, in 2005 to uh, 2010 in, in Australia as an expatriate, really fortunate. Um, and uh, so I got close to you know, the management of the company, uh, did a lot of work on strategy and merger and acquisitions, uh, corporate real estate. And, um, and then I got an opportunity in, uh, in 2012 to join a rather large organization called Layton. And Layton is in mining, construction, and engineering. It has changed names since then. Uh, uh, it had 52,000 employees, mostly in the Middle East. Australia was uh, where the headquarter was, or still is, and then uh, Southeast Asia. And, uh, and my role in that organization was a procurement role. I was hired to actually um, help the head of procurement, who was new as well, and a really small team of, of five all up to um, understand what the company was buying in terms of product and services. And so the first thing you do when you spend $20 billion is to actually um, figure out some categories of spend and put you know, that spend into buckets and make sense of it and see if you can actually you know, do some cost savings by, um, I don't know, going to a specific hotel chain or using a specific airline or using you know, that type of equipment for um, the trucks on our mining sites. And so we had a bunch of um, really smart uh, analysts that were crunching numbers for weeks. And then they came back to us with a list of suppliers or vendors um, and spend. And, um, and, uh, and, and some of those um, um, suppliers we just put on the side because the spend was rather high and we thought we could you know, um, do something with it or it was just odd. And, uh, and one of them was definitely odd. Um, it was um, a cottage, and for me a cottage is like a B&B, &B. it's something you rent out to put your people to bed at night on a mining site or close to a mining site. And with that specific cottage, we were spending $2.2 million, um, and at the time in 2012 there was parity between US and Australian dollars, so don't worry about converting anything. Uh, and um, uh, so it was $2.2 million for the previous 12 months in that cottage, and I thought, you know what? 2012 was a mining boom. Uh, globally, we were spending a lot of money on everything. Usually it was um, twice the price on you know, tires or accommodation, um, airplane, anything was really, really expensive uh, in, in, in that, during that time. But $2.2 million, I thought, you know, we better buy the bloody cottage and rent it ourselves. And so I took that supplier aside amongst others and then rang accounts payable and said, hey, can you read what's on those invoices? And it was, yeah, it's a corn cottage, um, Australian business number, whatever, for consulting services for the period ending May 2012, $57,000. Oh, interesting, a cottage, a cottage telling you um, uh, consulting services. Can you read me the second one? And it was the same thing, except that it was for uh, the previous months and the spend was uh, nearly a quarter of a million dollars. Um, this is when I actually did a bit of search. Um, I'm the type of guy who wants to understand things and see if I don't get it, I just, uh, I just you know, look for something and. Um, and I went onto the internet, put that Australian business number on a government website, got a name, took that name randomly, put that into the company directory and got a match. Um, I saw the face of a gentleman that I actually interviewed three weeks before. And that's when my whole life went um, upside down. That gentleman was really, really powerful in that organization. He started 30 years ago um, and went up the ladder to be the um, general manager for finance for uh, Queensland, which is one of the largest states in, uh, in Australia. And, um, and I actually interviewed that gentleman amongst many other, uh, others in the, uh, in the company just to understand how we were buying product and services. And, uh, and so um, at the end of each day, we were doing some debriefing with, uh, uh, with the team and, and he came up 
few weeks before because uh, my boss, the chief procurement officer, had the chance to actually meet with him in person. He was the one running procurement for the whole of Queensland because we didn't have any procurement professionals. And uh, we knew he was married. We knew he had a daughter that was about to get married. And so all of that information came back to me within um, you know, a blink of an eye as if I've picked up something in that system and it's actually you know, wrongdoing, then that guy is in deep, deep trouble, but not just that guy, you know, the family uh, and friends um, around him. So the next question is, you know, what do you do? And actually, in that moment, um, when you're doing your work, um, you don't think that you're going to be a whistleblower. It just doesn't come up to your mind. It's, uh, you're doing your job, and you're just trying to actually make sense of that. And what happened to me is what happened to many, many other people, which is you actually want to convince yourself that you're wrong, because it can't happen that someone sent 308 invoices over 12 years um, without nobody not noticing it. There was at least 50 to 100 people that saw exactly what I saw. And so I was the newbie, still on probation, two months in. My wife was pregnant with baby number three, and I was just about to put my head on the chopping board. Um, and so I had to convince myself that I was wrong, because on, in our society, usually um, the majority is correct. That's what we get told, or that's what we see. And so there was definitely one answer to me. It was I had to prove myself that I was wrong. And so the next four hours were about you know, finding a way to make that legitimate until I actually realized I couldn't. And so I wanted to find a way to speak up. Um, I went onto the internet of the organization, really lucky, uh, or really lucky. They had access to, or I had access to, uh, it took me 30 minutes to find the code of conduct. Um, I didn't know that a whistleblowing policy, what that meant or anything, but I eventually found it, uh, read through it. Luckily, I had access to a so-called independent whistleblowing third party provider. Uh, it's a lot of buzzword, but uh, at the end, it's just one company that's handled the hotline, and mine was actually more than a hotline. So in the US, hotlines are like ultra popular. Uh, everybody, when you talk about whistleblowing, say, yeah, we've got a hotline. Uh, so we had the hotline, but we had better than that. We had the fax, uh, and believe it or not, I was probably 35 or 36 years old at the time, never used a fax in my entire life. Um, I had access to uh, a PO box, or so put something in the mail and hope for the best. I had access to um, an email address and a form on the intranet. So five different ways of actually speaking up, which is you know, pretty awesome in the days, uh, back in the days. But I never, ever felt comfortable in using any of them. And the main reason was actually that um, those mechanism, if I take the, the hotline, for instance, uh, and you put your shoes in someone that you know, uncovered something big and for which you still believe that you must be wrong, um, is uh, if you call someone, it's going to be in a call center, that person knows nothing about your company and what you're talking about. They just have a script with you know, questions on it. Um, you can't send them evidence on the phone, or if you know where to send evidence on the phone, just let me know. Uh, but I couldn't send those invoices on the phone. Um, and, um, and they've got no context. Um, they may have picked up my accent as well, and there was not that many froggies at the time working in that company. Um, so um, it all created you know, that atmosphere of feeling very, very uncomfortable. Um, so never had the courage of actually calling the hotline. I can tell you many stories because now I actually uh, randomly call the hotlines to see how they respond to, to calls, and it's, uh, it's fairly scary. Uh, the fax, I mentioned that, they never used the fax. The PO box, my thought was, one, I've got 308 invoices. Uh, maybe someone did put that in the mail before. I don't know who's going to pick it up, if anybody. And you know, what are they going to do with it? They can't actually reach out to me. They can't you know, communicate with me. So if I've got no feedback, then I've got no way to actually demonstrate whether it was wrongdoing or not. Um, the email address, of course, is not anonymous. They can track your IP address, even if you were to make up one, a fake one. And to be honest, at the time, I never ever thought about creating a fake email account. Um, and the form on the internet, same thing, they could have tracked my IP address and it was just a one-way street. So I was in a dead end and still no options for me to actually speak up. So the next two minutes is actually something that I recommend anyone in the room or in the other rooms um, not to do, which, is, or which was for me to speak up to my manager. The reason I did that was truly because that lady um, was new. She'd been there five months. She recruited me two months before, so she couldn't be part of the fraud scheme. I had one name, but there could have been dozens of people part of that fraud scheme. It was a lot of money. It was $20.7 million. Um, and, um, and so she was new. She recruited me. And she doesn't like when I say that, but she was and still is a bit of a shark. Like she wanted to get things done. She wanted to get the, proc the procurement team uh, recognizing that organization. And, um, and so I went to her, um, and her name is Vizna Lempazi, and I said, Vizna, can you see something, uh, or can you see the same thing that I see on those invoices? 
it took her less than five minutes to go through it. And she ran um, into the, um, the CEO office, which happened to be in the same building. The next day, um, the fraudster, um, his name is Damiano Carrigan, it's very, very public. If you put my name on the internet, uh, you'll find the, the story everywhere. Um, that gentleman was, uh, was interviewed by HR, and, um, and, and, uh, and a few weeks later, uh, was sentenced to 12 years behind bars. Uh, now, the little upside for you guys, if you ever want to commit a crime, I recommend to do it here in the US, because um, you may recall a company called uh, Enron, uh, the collapse at Enron, and sorry for whoever had shares in that company, uh, but uh, um, the collapse of Enron was about $70 billion, and, um, and I know personally, um, after the event, the uh, former CFO at, uh, at Enron, Andrew Fasto, um, he actually uh, served only five years. He got 10, but came out after five years behind bars. So um, all of that, if you want to commit a crime, do it here. Uh, it's, uh, they're a lot more gentle with, uh, with criminals in the US than Australia. Um, so now I've got someone behind bars, uh, but in the meantime, my company actually asked me to, um, if I wanted to go and sniff around and become an investigator, I've got no skills in investigation whatsoever. Um, and I said, I'm not too sure what you're asking me to do, but I'll do it, sounds fun. And so I became that guy who had access to absolutely everything in the company. And for two and a half years, I was sniffing around to the point that I actually managed about 50 investigations for my organization. And every single time I was able to pinpoint to a potential whistleblower, I got pretty much the same response, which is I fear for myself, my job, and my family, I will not speak up. And I can't blame any of those men and women because I was in the same shoes a few months or weeks before. Um, but what, that, uh, what I learned in that period was once my company was bleeding money, that's for sure, and they didn't know about it, or at least few individuals knew about it, but they didn't want to speak up. And, um, and the other issue is I managed to identify cat four, four categories of employees. We had the one that would go and get a job at Clayton and could see wrongdoing happening, but would turn around and get a job elsewhere because they can. Uh, the second category, and we had a lot of those, where individuals that were getting a job um, could see wrongdoing and then said nothing because they had the mortgage to pay, they had the school fees to pay, and to put food on the table. And for them, it was a lot safer to take the paycheck, and this was someone else's problem. The third category, and there was a fair bit of that as well, was employees were getting into the company, could see wrongdoing, and actually... A lot of people were doing it, so they were putting their finger in the pie and kind of writing another page on the employment contract, finding a way to benefit themselves. And, um, and it's shocking how people get used to that, um, and they do it in different ways. So again, if you're looking to skim your agency, ask me uh, a few tips, and I can definitely help with that as well. There's some, uh, uh, there's some, there's some like it's super easy to defraud an organization, um, uh, but just, just, uh, just be sure that at some point you might actually get caught. Um, uh, and the last bucket um, was uh, the bucket of the whistleblower, and I was fairly lonely in that bucket. Uh, and this is when I realized that in any organization, whether it's a government agency, um, a public or private or a company, or even a school, college, or university, our best asset are people. You know? In a company or a government agency, we pay employees every day, and most of them want to do good. They want to help. They want to go and you know, um, lift up the, uh, the, the organization. The only problem is we're preventing them from speaking up. And you know, when I look at, I've been part of um, a few uh, uh, management teams along the, uh, you know, over the years, and I think the intention is there. They truly want for, you know, most of them, they want to hear from their people, but they don't just don't have the right tools. And, uh, and so, you know, Chelsea was um, speaking this morning from uh, Qualtrics um, about engagement. And that was a great segue, actually, to you know, what we're going to talk about today, which is courageous conversation, or what I call also trusted conversations, and, um, and enabling an organization to actually engage with its workforce. Um, there's not much missing to make that work. But if I go back to my own story, what you know, could have prevented me or should have prevented me from speaking up was fear. The fear of not knowing what the response from the company is going to be. You know, they could have, I could have you know, used that hotline and it would have gone to the company and maybe it was not fraud. Because as an employee, most of the time you've got a narrow view on things. So you don't have the full picture and maybe I was missing something and maybe I was wrong. And so in my mind it was, I'm going to look stupid, I'm two months in, still on probation, I'm going to lose that job and I don't want to take a chance. And a lot of people 
behave in the same way. It's the fear of not knowing what the first response is going to be like. Um, now, if you want to go into other type of you know, misconduct or wrongdoings, uh, we can talk about a really famous case, I think, here in the US, which was 18 months ago, with Harvey Weinstein. You know, we've got 87 victims, and someone might say, yeah, but they might not all be you know, subject to sexual harassment or things like this. Okay, let's assume that 10 of them aren't. There's still 77 left. And even if it's half, you know, we still have 43 or 44 that are actually subject to some kind of you know, um, uh, misconduct or, or wrongdoing. It took three decades for one to actually speak up. And we wonder why, like if you subject to something, just go and tell someone. It's not that easy because they've got the fear, the fear of not knowing what the response is going to be like, you know, and we could see that in the media, uh, that quite often uh, they're being blamed for actually what happened. Um, and, um, and on top of the fear, they've got the shame, the shame of having to go through that event again, tell the story once more, which they definitely don't want to do, um, and, um, and then have to cope with the fact that from that time onward, everybody will be aware of it, their peers, their family, their friends, um, their colleagues, um, and that's why it takes so much courage for one person to come out. But as soon as one does, you've got everybody else that comes through and has, now is empowered to actually speak up. And so the idea of uh, you know, building courageous and trusted conversation is to find a way to make sure that people can actually speak freely without the fear, without the fear of being judged, without the fear of feeling that they're wrong because they might actually be wrong uh, in assessing that you know, this is fraud or corruption. Um, and, uh, and just being able to engage with people so they're free to speak up. But it only works if you've got a two-way conversation. So how do you make that happen? Um, the best way to actually make that happen is anonymity. But that doesn't work if you or people will you know, um, put a letter under the door because you can't communicate with them. Um, and, and the same thing you know, happens when you send something in the mail. Uh, that's why a lot of investigators spend, spend a lot of time doing you know, investigation, trying to engage with people, and they're actually stuck because they can't get access to evidence. Uh, but it's not that hard to actually you know, get people to speak to you um, if you make them anonymous. And then usually the first question that is being asked by you know, people is, but how do you know that it's not a false positive and that people are not trying to you know, um, create a big mess out of all that now that you empower them with anonymity? I can tell you, it takes so much gut to actually speak up even anonymously, anonymously that very few people you know, um, use any type of anonymous platform to, uh, to make jokes. Um, and, uh, and so the, um, what we've discovered over the years is um, by making people anonymous, you actually make them a lot more comfortable to engage with the company. But then we faced um, another issue, which was if you stamp a tool as being a whistleblower solution, a whistleblower platform. Realistically, most of you guys will never be whistleblowers. Um, I hope, at least for you, that you won't have to go through that. Uh, but it's not meant to happen to everyone in our lifetime, thankfully. Um, however, and, and so, you know, what, no matter what tool you're going to be facing, whether it's hotline, a fax, a peer box, an anonymous platform, or any kind of reporting channel, you're going to fear if you know that you're about to speak about something that can you know, put your life in danger or your job in danger or your family in danger. Um, and so um, what we've discovered is to enable people to talk about really, really challenging things in their lives, like you know, uncovering a $21 million fraud, um, you need to make it business as usual. Yeah, that's not so easy to do. Um, so the best way to actually do that is to offer a solution that people can use on a regular basis um, to report things that are not as dramatic as fraud or corruption or sexual harassment. And it could be that, you know, one of you works in a large government agency and you actually just got the job. Um, unfortunately, you know, two weeks from now, you had a one-week vacation plan to Utah or somewhere in Massachusetts. It's actually not a bad time of the year to go there. Um, and, uh, and now you feel that you got the job and you have to ask the question, can I take a week vacation? It's usually not the best thing to do when you start a new job. So what about, because you work in that large common agency, the ability you may have to actually you know, pop that question uh, and it'll be triaged to HR because it's related to HR and, uh, and you can be anonymous in the way you ask the question and HR will get the, the question and they might come back to you and say, hey, you know what, you've got X weeks vacation a year, we can't care less what you do with them. You, know, you can just apply for them and your manager will you know, approve them or they might say actually within the first six months we're not really entitled people to have vacations but you don't have to expose yourself. 
And so the idea of building um, you know, uh, or enabling courageous and trusted conversations is to help people ask questions that might you know, sound a bit silly, uh, but actually when they do that on a regular basis or they know where to go to ask those questions and they don't have to expose themselves, it becomes an engaging tool. So next time they might use you know, the tool, they might talk about uh, them being close to the burnout. They work 15 hours a day and they can't get the work done. Uh, they're exhausted and they think that you know, nobody's happy with the work that they, they, they're doing. And again, it'll be triage to HR and, uh, and HR might come back and say, you know what, you're not the only one and we can help, we've got tools and you shouldn't be working 15 hours a day. Um, um, so you know, let's engage. Um, so the idea of being able to start a conversation being anonymous, from one single place where you feel comfortable and then to decide whether or not we're actually, you're actually willing to give away your name to you know, seek help is also very important. Um, the, th the third time you might actually be engaging with your uh, agency could be on you know, someone walks out the door uh, for the second time in a row with three laptops under his arm on a Friday at 5 p.m. and you find that a bit odd so you can just uh, snap a, a quick picture, send that through your anonymous channel and say, is that okay that Joe Blog you know, walks out the door with three laptops and hopefully there's no one called Joe Blog in the room. Um, but, um, um, uh, and, and then it will be triage you know, to probably internal audit or whoever is managing this type of, of queries and they might come back in saying, actually this is not okay. And it might well be called whistleblowing but the idea is that because you've used the tool several times, you know, maybe you studied at college or uni and you reported things around bullying or drugs, violence, you know, weapons, whatever it might be, and then you take it into the workplace and you carry that tool with you that enables you to engage in, the, in those anonymous two-way you know, conversations is actually making you feel more comfortable about you know, having those trusted conversations. And the, uh, the best analogy I could find, and I know that one of the uh, sponsors is Google, you know, I bet most of you have you know, a Gmail account or a Yahoo mail account that you use for you know, email that you send to family and friends and you kind of trust that mailbox because it's there and you've been using it for years. It's always super handy, you, know, you can access it from your laptop or smartphone um, and it does the job really well. Um, you, know, you can think about a similar platform which would be anonymous by default from where you can actually start you know, um, anonymous conversations using an avatar. And so instead of being um, you know, um, uh, yourself, you'll be someone else. Um, and then um, you know, you'll be communicating with your organization and you only reach out to that, um, to that safe inbox when you feel like it. And, um, and so in, your, in the context of government agencies, of course, for me, you know, the, the view of being a whistleblower is, is your duty and it's super challenging. Uh, and it's super challenging because of what I've mentioned before, but also because of what we see in the media. You know, in recent months, more and more we see corporate scandals. Uh, we see uh, um, our uh, you know, people with a lot of power in politics you know, not necessarily behaving in the right way. And that doesn't give confidence um, in, in people. And again, you know, making the, uh, the bridge with uh, Chelsea's um, presentation this morning, um, it's hard to build the trust when us, as you know, normal citizens, we see what's happening up there. And it's quite ugly sometimes. So why? would we actually you know, put ourselves in danger and you know, risk to lose our job or worse? Uh, if you ask me you know, why I felt that I had to speak up you know, six years ago or six and a half years ago, uh, the answer is I had two kids at the time, the third one was on the way, and, um, and I want my kids to be good citizens of this, uh, this world, and if daddy doesn't show or lead by example, then I can't expect my kids to do the same. So for me, it was not a choice. I had to do it. I had to find a way. Um, I knew that there was, there was a risk, and the first one was the risk that I was, you know, I may have been wrong. Uh, but it was, uh, I think was, that force was you know, just too strong, and I just felt that I had to do it. Now, I've been empowered by, and very lucky that you know, my company kept me on board and asked me to become that, uh, um, that kind of a, uh, investigator uh, for a couple of years. And, um, and then I realized that I could, uh, you know, the solution was not that hard. It was just about, you know, tweaking, um, you know, existing tools to make them work for that purpose. And, uh, and, and also a lot of my time, and this is, you know, um, this is one, uh, one example of, uh, of that is I spend my time traveling the world, telling the story, telling how important it is to engage into um, uh, trusted conversation, courageous conversations. Um, and, um, and this is kind of my mission. So, Yes, I run a 
a company on the side, but uh, but most of the work that I do now is to uh, speak in front of people that you know work in um, uh, education or work for um, the corporate world or in, in in government and tell the story and explain you know that uh, that having those um, conversations with your people um, is really important. Um, the the way you behave at work if you're in a management position is really important. The tone um, at the top is key. There are some companies that you know we might never be able to help because of uh, of the way they're being run by you know management. So it's definitely you know the tone at the top does help a lot in terms of releasing those you know um, uh, difficult difficult conversations from from your people. Um, there's definitely a lot of um, communication that needs to happen. It can't be just a one-off. You can't just tell people, hey, if you've got an issue, just feel free to come. I've got an open-door policy that only works on paper. Um, as soon as you get into trouble, that, uh, that policy goes out the window fairly quickly for very good reasons. Um, so it's important to you know, talk about it. Um, something that my company failed to do um, uh, in 2012 was actually to, um, to take action in the sense of if you find someone that does something wrong, um, it needs to be made as an example, and that you actually took action, and what action you know were, um, were taken by the organization, and what you're doing to move forward. My company and you had to blow a few more millions in you know fixing the the leak and, and making sure that we had good segregation of duties so people couldn't you know commit that crime again. But what we didn't do well at the time was actually to make an example of that person as you know being um, uh, a fraudster. And no one else got punished for it. But that guy reported to other people in the organization. And those individuals were never blamed for not doing their job as a manager, which is sending a strong me message to every other manager in the company that, hey, you know what? If your people are doing something wrong, it's OK. You know, you'll still have your job tomorrow. And this is very wrong. Um, so again, difficult conversations are uh, definitely difficult in nature, but they don't have to be. They can be made a lot more easier. But it's all about you know the the turn at the top, the communication, and also understanding what I call the the framework. When you sign an employment contract, and uh, and I actually just started to draft it some here in the U.S. and uh, and I have to say that I was quite shocked because they usually fit in one page. Uh, but uh, back home in France or in Australia, there were definitely about you know 12 or 20 pages of employment contract, and that's the framework. That is the framework you're entitled to operate into. It's the do's and the don'ts. Um, and, uh, and this is an important document because it sets the standard for everybody. It means if you go outside of that framework, then you know, you're out of bound and you're you know, um, kind of outside of the rules that we've set as an organization. And I've noticed that people get really, really cushy with those um, boundaries. They get closer and closer to the red line. And that's what happened to Damiano Carrigan, the fraudster that I quote, where for him it was kind of easy to um, start doing the wrong thing and, and get really cushy with it um, and uh, to the point that he couldn't stop himself. Um, and once you've crossed that line, there's no turning back. And the reason there's no turning back is, one, because your lifestyle might change. Uh, but the main thing is, if you stop, someone may actually catch you. Because if you stop your pattern or your routine, that's when usually people you know, find out that you may have done something very unusual. Um, so this is also something very important to, uh, uh, to keep in mind. Um, I'd like maybe just to open up for questions if you've got any, any, any questions around you know, whistleblowing or trusted conversations or how we do that or what you're facing in your organization. Um, the last thing I'll say is around Legislation. There was actually an article um, uh, three weeks ago uh, in, uh, in in the U.S. from the Huffington Post talking about you know um, the f around the world there's more and more whistleblowing legislation popping up. Uh, I always say legislation is great because it's forcing companies or organizations to change the way they behave and put si put processes in in place and policies in place. That's not really helping whistleblowers to speak up because as I mentioned before, most whistleblowers don't know that they're whistleblower until after the fact. Um, but the fact that we've got legislation, and France is one of those countries that has really strong whistleblowing legislation for the last um, uh, 15 months. Australia just passed their own legislation in February. Um, there's 10 countries now in Europe, and, uh, and the Eurozone is about to pass their own whistleblowing legislation. In the US, you've got you know, the, the sarbanes oxley and the George Frank Act, and so uh, you know, some organizations um, mostly in the public sector, have something in place. Whether it's robust enough or not, I believe it is not. Uh, but there's definitely a way to improve things, to 
facilitate those trusted conversations. The good thing, however, is these legislations aren't uh, you know, um, gonna become more easy for organization. They're just gonna be strengthened even more. So the protection of you know, employees uh, will definitely be there at some point, uh, which, is, uh, which is very good news for, for all of us. Um, I'd say the US is a bit lagging behind um, you know, when I look at the rest of the world, uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's getting there. Um, and, uh, and in the US, you've got something that I'm uh, definitely against, which is um, part of the Dodd-Frank Act. You've got reward for whistleblowers, where a whistleblower can get a reward of you know, anywhere between 10 and 30% of the, um, the fine that may uh, uh, apply to an organization. And my own personal opinion on that is this is wrong. Um, we don't do it for the money. Uh, we do it because it's the right thing to do, because everybody should you know, be doing that. Uh, however, what I'm saying is, uh, if someone can't get a job because they blew the whistle, or they can't get a promotion, and they're kind of stuck in the organization because they've been flagged as being a whistleblower, they should definitely be um, kind of an insurance or a compensation scheme where people can be you know, um, supported, uh, even if it's to get their salary until you know, uh, the end of their lives. I think that's fair. Uh, but we're definitely not in um, as a whistleblower to win the lottery or retire early and get you know, a reward of potentially multi-million dollars from the SEC here in the US. So this is my only message about whistleblowers. If you ever think that whistleblowers are in it for the money, I think most of, the, most of us um, aren't, for, uh, aren't in it for the money. So if anyone's got a question, I'm happy to take questions now. Yes? Yes, yeah, sure. So, so, so the question is, um, how is Wispley, you know, assisting in that uh, uh, in that sense of you know enabling trusted conversations? So, going back to the example that I took with uh, with Google and, and Gmail, think about Wispley as being your anonymous inbox, and you will create that inbox by making up the username and password so they don't relate to your identity. And when you when you get access to your um, inbox, you can then engage into conversations with your with your organization. Um, usually it's you scan a QR code or you click on a button on the internet or you uh, click on a UI link that would have been provided to you by your organization. And, um, and then you can, um, most of them would have two channels. One is a live chat, you just ask a question uh, and it's being triaged to the right team that's gonna handle it. Or you fill in a form that they would have um, you know, configured previously. And when you engage in that conversation, um, the system will give you an avatar. So you might be, you know, the blue monkey now talking about bullying, and in three weeks you want to report a suspicion of fraud, and you might be the gray giraffe. So two different conversations, two different avatars, you're actually the same person. At the other end, the, co the company or the organization knows you as per your avatar, so they don't know that you're the same person. If you were willing now to give away your name on um, you know, the, uh, the bullying case, they will know your identity there, but they still don't know who you are on the, uh, the gray giraffe you know, avatar. And that's the idea, is you've got one inbox that is anonymous that you can access from anywhere at any time around the world, um, and, uh, and you can connect into it and engage into those trusted conversations. They don't have to be you know, uh, whistleblowing per se. Um, it can be any type of um, you know, well-being um, situation at work, or it could be misconduct or wrongdoing, uh, suspicion of anything happening in, in the company, uh, but at least you're free to you know, engage in those, in those conversations. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so, so some, some um, clients actually use it purely to engage with the audience. Um, and, uh, and yes, sometimes randomly, uh, and that's really where Wispley is actually moving into, where we started being, being a whistleblowing platform, but now companies use Wispley as an engagement tool to retain their, um, their people, because in a tight market, like we've got here in the US and in most countries around the world, where it's really hard to hire talent, you actually want to uh, attract them and you want to retain them and you want to make sure that they're being treated well. Um, and so what companies will do now is, uh, well, you know, when we started Wispley, a lot of our main contacts were chief compliance officer, chief risk officer, um, you know, chairman of the board or something like this that were really into the compliance space. Now we've got more HR people, head of people contacting us and say, hey, we want a tool that enables us to engage with our people um, so we can um, engage with them and see how well they're going. Others will engage with us as being customer service, customer success people that want to engage with the clients of the organization saying, we want to hear from, you know, in a government agency, maybe the citizens, we want to hear from them and we want to be able to 
um, you know, um, be on a level playing field where um, our, um, our citizen will not have the fear of giving, giving us feedback as a government agency. Um, so it's not about, again, wrongdoing or misconduct. It's about having honest conversations uh, between an agency that we would look as being, you know, uh, with a lot of power. And if I talk about, I know, the IRS, for instance, I might not feel super comfortable in being super honest with the IRS, fearing that they're going to knock on my door within two minutes um, and ask me, you know, strange questions. So what about enabling those trusted conversations or honest conversations with um, government agencies as well, with, you know, uh, people from the public that may have something to tell you, whether it's informative, whether it's feedback, whether it's, um, you know, they're happy or not happy about the service that you're offering. Um, it's all about being, uh, not, not judging people um, uh, from the first report that you receive and the ability to communicate with them uh, usually helps really quickly to identify the, the false positive from the real case that you want to actually handle. Yes? Where is your company incorporated out of and where is your infrastructure located? So, Wispley is uh, headquartered in Sydney, Australia. We've got um, an entity here called Wispley Inc. Uh, incorporated in Delaware and registered in Massachusetts. The data, and that's very specific to Wispley, uh, is hosted anywhere around the world. So our US um, clients have their data uh, hosted um, and uh, uh, processed and archived in, in the US. Uh, the French one will be in France and the German one will be in Germany. So we use um, predominantly Amazon Web Services to actually uh, host the data around the world. But we're not, um, uh, we can use uh, Google Cloud, we can use um, uh, uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, we've containerized the platform so we can um, uh, have the, uh, the data hosted in those different places. So, so it sounds like the company is based out of country that complies with United States law and requests for information, Correct. so is your infrastructure. Correct. So if you were, Superintendent. so this yeah. is not for whistleblowing on the federal government where they can no, so, so a lot of our clients in, um, in governments, for instance, or, or not even governments, but uh, uh, there's a lot of companies that actually uh, got caught by the SEC, for instance, for some type of wrongdoing or misconduct, and their only fear is to actually um, uh, expose their data uh, if there's, let's say, a, a court order um, and someone knock on the doors of Wispley and say, hey, show us the data behind that client. Uh, we have to comply with the law anyway, so we will provide that data. Uh, but a lot of our clients have what we call their own virtual private cloud and they own the encryption keys uh, to the data. So um, that w we can end, uh, we can, um, end all the data, but it will be encrypted. Um, the only way to actually get access and decrypt that data would be to go to the client to get access to those keys. Um, so that's the, the way around. But we we have to comply with still a, a very legitimate business. Yes. So CIPA now has a live link to our internal Wispley reporting center um, that we partake in where we take those fraud or wrongdoing reports to the contract that they want to just send feedback to us. So we set up a separate form for that. That's linked from our contact us page. So if you want to try it and learn more about it. Yep, so uh, just for people in, in other rooms, because I know that the sun is not going well, but uh, Catherine was mentioning that CPA is actually using um, uh, Wispley, and that if you uh, were willing to actually engage with, with CPA, you can, uh, you can find the link on the, uh, on the CPA uh, website. Great, thank you. Thank you for having me, and please, I'm going to stick around for uh, a little while, so if you've got any, uh, any other questions, feel free to, uh, to come and find me. Thank you very much. Thank you.